And again, so Northern Canadian Cooperative Examples. So we'll go into the behind the scenes now. I'm going to hand it over to Margaret Lund to be the moderator of this next session. And from that session, we then have a further session on theoretical framing that will be moderated by Sonia. And then following that, as you will notice in the agenda, we go into breakouts. So there aren't any actual formal breaks in the next couple of hours until that breakout. I always say, I think we all know this, we can get up, move around, don't show your video, stretch as you need to, or run off for five minutes. Um, you know, you're the master of your own destiny in terms of your time and how you get what you need. So Margaret, over to you. Thank you for hosting this next session. Okay. Well, it is absolutely my pleasure <laughs> to moderate this next session because it's um, one of the most interesting to me. So we are, are very um, pleased to have um, Anne-Marie Marianne of the University of Sherbrooke and um, Mary um, Leclunyuk from Arctic Cooperatives in Canada. So they're talking about, um, each of them, about two different examples of, of really interesting, impressive, inspiring um, federations of community-based cooperatives uh, serving Indigenous peoples in the Arctic and um, other parts of Northern Canada. So I'm going to not say any more. And I think we're going to start with Anne-Marie. All right, thank you. Very nice uh, to meet you. Nice to meet you, Mary, as well. I was very uh, excited to be in the session with uh, with you, and I can wait to learn more as well about the Arctic Co-op Network. Um, I will share my screen in a second. My name is, so is Anne-Marie Nerien. I work at IRECUS. We are a research and education institute based in uh, Sherbrooke in Quebec. Um, and uh, I have been lucky enough to work with the Fédération des Coopératives du de Nouveau-Québec. This is a network of cooperatives in Northern Quebec. I will show you in a minute where is that. And I have completed almost in two weeks, going to be uh, formally completed uh, to do my PhD with the Federation that is now known as uh, ILARISAC. Um, so I will uh, speak a bit about the history of Ilarisac, Nunavik, um, some element of cohesion and tension in governance and the implementation of the co-ops, um, some elements of, or the importance of territorial and cultural anchoring and a few final remarks. Um, here is a map of Nunavik. So Nunavik is Northern Quebec. It's everything North of the 50th, 50th, parallel. Um, there are 14 communities. I have been lucky enough to visit them all uh, along the course of two winters. And yes, I was happy to travel <laughs> to Nunavik for winters. I loved it. Uh, 14 communities, 14 co-ops, so one in each of the communities. The headquarters of the Federation is based uh, in Montreal, close to Montreal. The reason being, and we will come to that a little uh, later, but the reason of the headquarters being uh, close to Montreal is because they need huge warehouses in order to uh, to stock all the products, furniture that they need for all the cooperatives. Um, and this, the products and, and furnitures are sent by boat twice a year along the coast of, uh, of Nunavik. Um, most 90 plus percent of the communities uh, of the community are uh, Inuit, except for uh, the village of Kujuratik. In, in this case, Kujuratik is half Inuit and half Cree. So half of the community is actually called Wapmagutsui, uh, but the co-op is, uh, uh, is composed of both Inuit and Cree. So both nations are members of the same cooperative. Um, so this is, it, it, and it's important to be, visualize the, the territory because it has a great impact on how the co-ops are organized and the type of services they are providing. Um, those co-ops are consumer co-ops and they are multi-services co-ops. And when I say multi, I mean multi-services, um, except for the example of the Arctic Co-op, this is one of the, the 
the example of the most diverse products and services provided by a co-op that I know of. Um, so it's, they are providing grocery, financial services as well, postal services. Canada Post have their uh, offices in the co-op building. Cable, fuel distribution, uh, in some cases, restaurant, uh, fishing, hunting camps, um, tourism. So it's a multi-service cooperative. That is, those are the services offered by the local cooperatives to individual uh, members. And one of the specificities is that when a product or a service is provided in one of the communities, uh, the aim is to provide it to all the communities as well. So in some instances, it means that they will need to have uh, some kind of solidarity or to pay for communities that have less uh, population in order to provide the service to the population. But this is one of their uh, aim is to provide the same products and services to, the, uh, to all the 14 co-ops. This is the list, I'm not going to go through it all, but this is the list of all the services provided by the Federation to the local cooperatives. Um, so obviously purchase distribution or services to the stores. So through the Federation, they are, uh, they have economy of scale, obviously, um, but also the sale of the promotion of Inuit art, uh, mainly sculptures, but not, not only. Um, accounting and auditing are services provided as well by the um, by the, the, the federation. Coordination, uh, public representation, development of new project, uh, transportation, fuel uh, distribution as well. In some cases, the federation is providing their, those services uh, through one uh, company that is owned by the federation. Uh, in, in, in globally or uh, just in part. So the Federation might be the, the, the only shareholder of this company, for example, uh, transportation, or can be a shareholder of just a percentage of this company. This is just to give you a little uh, portrait, and I know that's extremely quick. There would be a lot more to, uh, to say about it, but I'm, I, I want to jump directly on go most governance uh, matters and it's important, I think, to share a few, a little background on the implementation of the co-op and the history about the implementation of the co-op. So the first cooperative was created in Nunavik in 1959, uh, in Cagnières sur droite so on the east part of Nunavik. Uh, so late 50s, early 60s, five cooperatives were created. Uh, the federation was created in 1967. Um, and it happened at a time where profound changes happened in Nunavik. Economic changes, uh, people were, the territory was going from a subsistence and re reciprocity economy to a monetary and market economy. Uh, before the Hudson Bay Company, uh, there was no money really going on in, on, the, on the territory. So the HBC, the Hassan Bay Company, had the monopoly of the fur trade, uh, but also uh, of the sale of a few basic products, flour, uh, sugar, tea, things like ammunition, things like that. So that was the HBC that had the monopoly. The co-op broke that monopoly, uh, but still the co-op uh, participated and was instrumental in this change in the type of economy that was going on on the territory. There were also political changes uh, in the sense that the federal and provincial government were more and more involved uh, for the better or the worse. I'm not going to go into that part of, a, of it, but the, federal, the governments were more and more uh, involved. And for the more or less 20 years, there was no political representation apart from what's was coming from the co-op. So the co-op for more than almost 20 years were uh, the main political representative of Inuit in face of uh, government. There were also important social changes in the sense that Inuit were going from uh, a different kind of way of living to a permanent settlement. So that was a very important um, uh, change and the co-op was at the same time a, a tool and a place to 
learn to know each other and to learn to work together in the sense that families were living uh, uh, more apart. And at some point, communities as the 14 that we've seen were created. Families came to those communities and the co-op as, as um, people explained to me during the, the interviews, the co-op was really a place to learn to work together and to, uh, to get to know each other as well. And suddenly, obviously, all those changes, and as well, uh, along with Christianity, uh, brought some cultural and spiritual changes. And I'm not gonna, I'm not a specialist of cultural uh, in with identity. This is not, I mean, this is not, uh, other people, especially Mary, could have so, uh, a say uh, on that. But it is very obvious, and people told me as well when I was uh, in an event that those changes were uh, culturally and spiritually uh, important as well. And when the co-op were uh, implemented, the perception people had of the co-op uh, was, it was not all black or all white. Uh, for some people, it was very far from, from their ways of life, saying that even though it was a cooperative, it was still a store. Uh, even though it was not the HBC, you still had to go to the co-op store and pay with money. So it was a big change as well. Um, and you had to use democracy in order to elect representative, which was different as well as the, the, the previous way of uh, giving leadership. So it was at the same, but also it was close to uh, some ways of life saying that we were, it was talking about solidarity was also about the responsibility. So it was also, the fit was good as well, but it was not, necessarily an easy fit either. So people had to adapt to the co-op model, but a co-op model had to be, oh, there was some eco. Um, but the co-op had to be adapted as well to the local specificities. And for example, um, AGMs still today uh, are uh, broadcast on the radio. Uh, radio being a playing a central role in those communities as a, a communication tool, um, and it's more often than not, as as people uh, explain to me, uh, there's a lot of nomination. So it's not so much election than nomination. So someone will call on the radio saying, "I nominate this person to be on the board." Um, so. As uh, people from the south, and I, I mean, I am from the south <laughs> compared to where is Nunavik. Um, it, 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 in my understanding, in my, my non inuit way of understanding, this is not a democratic ways of doing things. As I am, I'm, I learned uh, democracy in a co-op to be, uh, to be uh, experienced. But in this case, this is one of the adaptation that they, that people made. Uh, to, of the of the co-op model, and oh, I'm going quick because I know the <laughs> time is running. Huh, Margaret, you'll tell me when I have like one minute left, I guess, or something like that. All right. Um, I, I want to talk a bit about uh, territorial and cultural anchoring, um, in the sense that. Uh, most often than not, consumer cooperative are disregarded as a transform transformative uh, co-op model. Um, we do not consider that the, co the, the, the co consumer co-op can have, can play an, an important role, a profound role in the communities. Um, in the case of the of uh, Isaac and the Nunavik cooperatives, 85% of the population is a member of the co-op. In Nunavik, and it is the largest private employers as well of the territory, right after the government. And when I asked people what is the role of the co-op in your community, people had a hard time uh, explaining that role. So I, I switched my question and I asked, but well, what would be your community without the co-op? And the answers were for, for them, it was it was very hard to even imagine the community without their co-op. And someone that told me, well, without the co-op, we would be second class citizens. Even today, not just in, 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 in past history, but even today we would be second class citizens. And this is not something we are used to hear, to hear about a consumer co-op. 
right? But in this case, it, it, it is it really plays an instrumental role in the the, the creation in, in 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 the community itself. Um, so the case of of um, Ilahisak and the Nunavik Co-op and and can bring a few question to the model in general. And this is, and I strongly believe that we can learn from the, uh, the Inuit example for the, 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 general, uh, the general cooperative model. Um, we can ask ourselves, is the purpose of a consumer co-op necessarily or only to reduce the costs? Can we understand consumer co-op uh, in a broader sense or is the cooperative democratic governance to, I would say, Eurocentric, or do we have a, 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 a ways of understanding the democracy in a, in a, a shallow, I don't, I'm not sure of the word, but you know what I mean, right? <laughs> um, so as a, as a conclusion, the importance, it shows, this case shows the importance of considering local specificities uh, in the implementation of the co-op. How are we taking into account the local history, the local leadership, the local practices when we implement a co-op? And if we are able to take into account territorial and local anchoring, we probably will be able to enhance and diversify the impact and the purpose of consumer co-op. And this can be true in Inuit communities, as we've seen in Nunavik, but this can be true as well in other kinds of communities, in other kinds of territories, or even in some industries as well. So how do we take into account local specificities uh, when we try to implement the co-op model, and how do we adapt the co-op model to those specificities? And that would be it. And I'm sorry if I went a little uh, over. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think we're good on time. Thank you very much. So um, Mary, would you like to take over with a similar but also different example? Um, thank you very much for inviting Arctic Cooperative on that one. Um, it's interesting, there's a sim lot of similarities to, uh, on the services and the uh, review of uh, overview of FCNQ in the membership that we provide in the Arctic Canada. Um, one of the things I um, would like to just briefly introduce on the things that um, Arctic Cooperative does in the sense of that the diversity was talked about in the governance model as well as the business unit. So uh, what things I uh, want to give you an example of the Arctic um, Canada and there'll be some uh, presentations on the map to geographic region shortly, but I do want to give you a little bit of perspective of, of video. Uh, this video really enlightens me because it's really close to where I grew up in. It's a, actually a next community. It's a flying community of Talukuyak, um in the above the Arctic Circle. So it's really giving you a perspective of, of where the Arctic this is. This is Lenny. He's Inuk and lives in the Canadian Arctic. He documents bits of his daily life on his TikTok account and gives a candid view of things like hunting and temperatures below negative 30 degrees Celsius, navigating by snowmobile over sea ice, even if there's no landmarks to let him know where he's at, and just having fun with his family. There's the daylight that we get during the day. It's 103. In the afternoon, minus 48 with wind chill. This is Anglo. Pretty big. Could fit quite a few people. Little mattress, caribou skin mattress. We get ice from the lake. We save it for tea. Uh, we use ice chisel. The ice chisel that we have is right there. It's about eight feet long. For the people that want to know where I live, there's USA on the bottom, Canada and the dotted line is Nunavut. That's our territory. And my home is right in the middle. People come from the south. They come into this land and say, oh, there's nothing here to see. You don't see anything when you're out on the ice. It takes a long time to figure out where you are, but we use 
the wind direction and the sun because we don't have any landmarks, any trees or anything to go by maps. You're just out on the sea. I, very nice day. No more. The wind is really calm now. This my dad over here. We hunt seals, anything that we can find out there to survive. And whatever we eat, we take it all. We share it with our family and we don't leave anything out there for waste at all. I do enjoy the weather out there and I do enjoy the land, the air, the scenery around here. We don't see any trees. So we see landmarks such as the hills, the lakes, the mountains, whatever valleys we can find. And we go by what we see out on the land and know where we are. Okay, this is four hours out, this is two hours out, and this is where we catch fish, seals and all that, we, we know all the land by name. That knowledge is passed on from generation to generation. This uh, video really brings home uh, a lot of things that um, from the, uh, the membership point of view, I like it when he says that it's uh, minus 48 and he says, oh, it's very nice day today. <laughs> That's always interests me and from the bringing it home. One of the things in that geographic region that we serve is in anywhere uh, earlier on, it was mentioned that the three territories is uh, Yukon, Nunavut, and Northwest Territories. Uh, we have 32 member independently locally owned cooperative business in Canada's Arctic. Imagine Canada's Arctic, uh, very little known in Canada itself. Um, when I do a presentation or orientation, I, I tend to ask people, how many of you have you been in the Arctic? And there's very little uptake from uh, being in the Arctic and uh, uh, traveling into those communities. Um, uh, Canadian Arctic producers uh, were the art marketing arm started in the 60s and how it established itself was that the carvings that uh, was mentioned earlier uh, particularly how to market that in southern Canada. That's how the cooperative started in um, the Arctic Canada as well as in northern uh, Nunavik region. Uh, Canadian Arctic producers, um, uh, CACFL uh, incorporated in 1972, we're actually celebrating our 50th year, but the cooperative uh, in the Arctic Canada started about over a little 60 years ago. Uh, they amalgamated to Arctic cooperative what is this today as a federation. Um, Multi-purpose businesses was mentioned. Uh, one of the things is that uh, individual members uh, cooperative owns over uh, $40 million. Um, just imagine that uh, the most remote communities, very fly-in communities, I say remote, meaning that it's offline communities and try to do business in that uh, environment. We tend to see it from the point of view in foreign countries where it's remote, very, but, very similar things in the Arctic Canada and um, uh, from the population uh, may sometimes under 200 people, um, anywhere from 100 to 1500 uh, people in the uh, Arctic Canada. And these are the remote tiny communities and arriving by um, products by small aircraft and annual resupply that is once a year. Uh, one of the things is that there is no road access to a lot of these. Um, so, so, so anywhere from the groceries to uh, petroleum to cable services to hotel, um, when the membership is asking for services, that's what we intended uh, as the federation um, governing body from the board of directors um, to see if uh, what are the things that we need in the community it tends to be the establishment of uh, starting a business. 
The Federation of Arctic Cooperative is, uh, is a joint uh, purchasing and delivering groceries uh, products, the logistic from the airlines to resupply. Uh, that's what we provide um, to the 32 member location. The, uh, the home office in Arctic Cooperative in, here in Winnipeg is also uh, uh, looks at uh, accounting services, fin financial statements to invoicing. Uh, just last year, actually this year, we just introduced tax planning, um, filing tax. Um, a lot of the communities don't have access to Service Canada. Um, uh, so these are the uh, services that we provide. The employees um, also have payroll and uh, benefits now. Um, there was a lot of disparities for many years, um, but in the sense of um, uh, uh, disparity, meaning that um, their benefits um, all, often um, sometimes we're saying you have benefits to health. Well, no, we don't. Um, it's provided like any other Canadians, but benefiting uh, from the eye prescription and those kind of things is what's introduced. Um, so those are the things that were provided. Um, new business lines, um, non-co-op business, we tend to get into partnership with that. Uh, planning projects, management uh, projects, and financial um, Arctic Co-op Development Fund is a, a arm that provides um, uh, funding to the cooperatives in 32 member location. Um, one of the things is that um, trying to find ways of effectiveness um, to 32 unique, meaning unique, very diverse, very diverse businesses. And uh, how do, as a federation, um, individual needs of each co-op are very in individual. One co-op um, doesn't always work in another, like in the cooperative movement, it's, they're all cooperative, uh, but other uh, services may not uh, have different approaches, different ways. So we have to look at it from the individual uh, basis. Um, as a federation, we have to be careful as well that we don't own these businesses. We have to make sure that they make the decision making. Uh, we can make recommendation uh, from there. Arctic Cooperative also um, um, actually got the top employer in Manitoba for the last five years, uh, focusing specifically to the members' needs. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more on this shortly. As a uh, annual meeting, uh, proposing to the uh, uh, Arctic Cooperative anywhere from training, strategy, decision making, socializing, um, it's proposed to resolutions and um, our members are not afraid to voice their um, areas of imp improvement to the Federation. If, we, if they say to us, we need to improve or adjust uh, certain areas of services, they'll let us know. Um, and uh, member cooperative uh, sent two delegates to the uh, annual meeting of Arctic Cooperative. Um, the first delegates to the uh, board of directors. Uh, a second director is uh, uh, either the uh, vice chair. Uh, normally we have making sure that the president is in, in attendance and as well as the uh, probably uh, uh, emerging co-op leader. Uh, this is very crucial on our side too as well. As we know across Canada, it's an aging population, and how do we uh, uh, include the younger generation uh, into the uh, governing body? And it's encouraging from our side that uh, in this past AGM, uh, there were young leaders at the governing body, which was very nice to see. Um, and they, they held, the, the seats are held scatteredly um, from the point of view of um, three-year terms uh, as well. Uh, that is also... Um, we have interpretation. Um, I, I often hear your language of choice. You can go on the interpretation across Canada and there's two language of choice in Canada, um, English or French. Uh, we offer it in Inuktitut um, as well as um, interpretation to English uh, from that perspective, uh, from, uh, it, from anywhere from that. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, uh, the language in the various um, territory as well. The resolutions that I passed are, are directing the Federation to do it towards the initiative. Uh, so those are the things that uh, the membership uh, tends to vote on. District representation, um, diversity of business that was mentioned earlier, district representation, representation is, in, is very important to the membership. Uh, this is a geographic region uh, from Okro, Yukon. That's a population of a little over 200 people. Uh, in the Western uh, Arctic and anywhere from McPherson, uh, we have District uh, 7 representation, which is a very large territory in the 
uh, Nunavut region. Kikiktaluk uh, uh, used we, in English term is Baffin region, uh, South Baffin to the Kivalik region, to the Kizikmir region, to the Mackenzie region, to Yellowknife. Um, and one director from each district is elected uh, to, we have seven board members on Arctic Cooperative. They're all from the Arctic Canada, uh, which is so important to the membership. Um, they're scattered in the three year term. Uh, and if, uh, if a director is, um, fluent in, um, in their own language, we uh, have an interpretation during our AGM, just, make sure, just making sure that it's inclusiveness in that particular area of the language of choice. The other thing is that um, the, our board of directors meet quarterly, um, regional uh, uh, topics are discussed, um, and as well as tech, uh, technology being the COVID year, we really moved towards uh, virtual AGMs, uh, virtual meetings, uh, same thing. Technology uh, was well adapted into the meetings. Um, some, of, some of our directors um, are very versed in there. One of the things is that not being able to travel to the member co-op AGM, uh, we found a way to use that um, from the staffing and the board of directors. I myself and um, Rod do our one-on-one -on -one regular communication to the presidents at the member club location to make sure that um, as a federation that we're, uh, are we providing uh, the, the uh, support to your co-op? So individualizing that from the communication, that made a big difference on our side. Um, the presidents actually appreciate the conversation, uh, having that one-on-one, -on -one, just a quick touch base 15 minutes max, um, just asking them to see how we're doing as a federation. Uh, basically, that's what it is on the communication level. Uh, and as well as the four regional uh, meetings that uh, board of directors meeting that is held uh, quarterly. One of the things that uh, my role as an organization, uh, although it's not in my job description, um, I do one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. I grew up in the Arctic. I can speak the Inuktitut language. So when the board of director wants to speak their own language, we can have a conversation in, in um, the language as well as the orientation. In the time of general manager was mentioned earlier on, they not, uh, a lot of the general managers are hired from the Southern Canada. I may not have the crop experience or the culture aspect of the uh, community that they're going into. So part of my job is orientating the uh, general manager of the culture shock you will be going into uh, and uh, the language, the environment, the harsh environment, the darkness, the 24 daylight adapt, adapting into that environment can be very harsh on the individual, but so, one of the things I try to encourage as much as possible is be aware of the areas that you're going into because they're small remote community um, on top of that as well. I come from a co-op system background for 30 years um, from that experience as well is to try to introduce um, to the uh, new staff uh, of Arctic Cooperative of the uh, members that we serve in the Arctic Canada. This is an interesting aspect as well that um, uh, our district su support advisors um, are very in a very comprehensive way. Also work closely with the, uh, the governing body at the member co-op, uh, anywhere from seven board members to seven, uh, nine board members. Diversity, um, we're very glad to uh, uh, say that 51% um, of our female representation, uh, not that long ago it was um, male representation, majority of them. In the last 10 to 15 years, this really shift. Um, the female representation is uh, well balanced in the governance body, which is we're very proud of that representation. Very diverse and the freight, uh, cable, hospitality, groceries, uh, anywhere from that per perspective. So those are the things that um, uh, training, training is what's talked about. Uh, the best practices also mentioned uh, as well. So the um, district support advisors actually support from the governance body. Uh, if they have some um, challenges or some things that they need advice, they tend to come to me and how to approach these um, uh, discussions that might happen in the community. We do a balanced scorecard as well. Uh, we, uh, we try to make sure that we're meeting the balanced scorecard as, as a uh, organization. Have we met the training? Have we supported the, uh, how are the co-op staff doing? Member engagement initiative, social well-being in the community. 
we know there's a lot of challenges. Um, so we try to meet those needs as much as possible, anywhere from food security to mental health uh, is expanding in the community. So those are the things that we try to uh, support the community as much as possible. So these are a few uh, items that um, uh, crop management board of directors training uh, we do in Southern higher orientation that I mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of things that we do as an organization to support um, uh, the community uh, staff and as well as general managers that are going into the uh, remoteness uh, in the community. We have changed over the years as Arctic Cooperative as is celebrating um, the uh, fund, um, crop development fund is supporting the member cooperative uh, enhancing facilities, purchasing equipment, financing, resupply, as well as uh, we have a partner with uh, um, Nunavut Seeding can supply that supplies products into the Arctic communities. Uh, and as well as uh, Federation increasing the buying power of the members because they, they look to the crop system to buying um, products. So, we continuously revolve um, around this on this one, um, but uh, as a federation, that's what we do to try to serve the members need as much as possible. Uh, competition, uh, online uh, products, uh, Amazon is in the community. They're a very huge, big competition besides the uh, Northwest company and, and continues to grow in their best um, diversity in business. So uh, services support is what we try to offer it with our members uh, as much as possible. So that's um, on behalf of Arctic Cooperative. So pay me. Okay, thank you so much. So we have we have 13 minutes for questions, and we had a couple in the chat. Um, so Camilla had a question. Erin, can you unmute different people, or should I just restate the question? Uh, they can unmute themselves. We have this set up as a meeting. Okay, great. So Camilla, do you want to ask you a question about about um, I think particularly for Marie how other community interests are kind of impacted by the co-op beyond just the members? Yes, it can be for, uh, to both. And Marie, I, I, I posed the question before I heard Mary. So to both how these uh, cooperatives, particularly the member cooperatives of the Federation, uh, from what I hear, they act like community cooperative. No, they respond to broad community needs, not just that those of the members. So how do, how do they, in an institutional way, make sure that they're truly responding to the larger community and not just the co-op members. Maybe it would be good to know what percentage of the community are cooperative members, if you have that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Great example. Um, well, in, in, in Nunavik, 85% uh, in general, so in the old territory, 85% of uh, the people are co-op members. And in fact, in, the, in some communities, I would say like 98% of the people are member of the co-op. And in this sense, and it happened in quite often, even what just in, in, in the language we use and, and they, they use is co-op and community will be blended together. There's like no difference. And, and the ways in which the co-op is answering the members needs is by answering their need as community members. So it's not so much what do, the members need, but what is the community needing? And this is why it's such a multi-service co-op. So, oh, our members, uh, they need grocery, let's have a grocery. Oh, our members, they need fuel distribution. Then we'll go into the fuel distribution business. Oh, our, co our members, they need uh, uh, some kind of a travel agency. Let's start a travel agency. So it, it's really based on what the members need. But in this case, the it's so close. It's not, there's not much a difference between are you a co-op member or are you a community member? It's it's pretty much the same. I, I and maybe Mary, you you see the same thing in, in, in the communities as well in the in the uh, Arctic Co-op network. I totally agree. It's hard to explain it because it's so intertwined. Like it, the cooperative is so ingrained to the people. And it's hard to separate that uh, the particular area, um, and so because it's so ingrained, it's like it's part of the community. It's it's it, um, and I, I can't explain it a little bit any further than what it is already is because it's so ingrained. If you don't, if the if the community don't have the service, the co-op tend to establish those small business the services into in order to meet the community needs. So I can only respond to that in that way. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Tio, do you want to ask your question, but rather than have me state it, restate it, it's an interesting one. Can you unmute? Sure, let me go ahead and ask. I mean, it's a very big question, so I don't <laughs> expect you to come up with some very neat and tidy answers. But I'm finding both both um, presentations uh, quite fascinating, and I'm curious about the beliefs, value systems, norms, and worldviews that inform the practices that you're describing, especially this kind of like community-oriented way. Um, if the community needs something, it's provided. You know, it doesn't necessarily bound to some kind of a, a cooperative typology. So I'm curious about the the, the um, value systems and norms and worldviews that kind of inform that kind of practice. Because it's obviously, to me, um, hearing this, I hear there's some kind of philosophy behind this. And I'm curious about what that is, if you're able to. Yeah, uh, it's a good question because again, in beliefs of what what can we what the what can can the uh, cooperative bring into the community is the philosophy in the sense of that, and it's so ingrained that it's hard to put a a, a face to it or put a number to it, um, because I think in the beliefs of uh, it's very relevant to the uh, Inuit or indigenous or. Dene uh, believes it's the closest model you can actually uh, uh, put together uh, when they were establishing um, about 60 years ago. I know from the, the beginning, the early on, the leaders had visionary. The vision of the closest to adapting into the culture, uh, inclusiveness is the biggest thing, the language uh, that they can speak to in their own uh, 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 the Ilagiksa video that really tells the story is nobody should be left behind. The philosophy was so important to them that the fact that they want to uh, own their own business and they didn't want someone else to control their own businesses. So that was part of the reason why I don't know if there's a belief that we have that it's just ingrained to us. So I don't know how else to add to it. Thank you for the question though. <laughs> Maybe if you don't mind, I would add a little uh, something about it. It's uh, and thank you very much, Mary, for bringing up the the motto, the the, the slogan, the slogan of the uh, of Ilahisak is together working to develop as people, leaving none behind. So yes, we're talking about solidarities. Yes, we're talking about autonomy because we did want to develop by ourselves and for ourselves. But the the cho the, the the choice of word that like working to develop as a people. In French, it's en tant que peuple, leaving none behind. So it, it's a very encompassing understanding of the role a co-op can play. And it's not putting the business part of it on one side, the association part of it on one side, or the identity part on one side, or the social part. It, it really, if we are to find the tool and a way to develop, we will do it as a people, accordingly to our values, and, and including everyone. And, and there's no, no, no such thing as putting one kind of need on one side. And cooperatives, in the definition of a co-op, in the co-op identity statement, we're talking about uh, meeting economic, social, cultural needs and aspiration. And I strongly believe that the example of Arctic co-op and the Ilahisak uh, Ila co-ops, they really show that we can really uh, have a tool, even though it's a consumer co-op that answer economic, social, cultural needs, but also aspiration. And that's very unique. And this is something we can learn from as a co-op model in general. OK, thank you. Um, we had just a uh, kind of a technical question, I guess, but <laughs> back to resources. Someone wondered, Mary, if you could just talk about how the, the fund, where the money came from for the Arctic Co-op Fund and, and Emory, I don't know if they have that also um, in Nunavik, but it's a you know a fund to help the, the individual stores do their big annual purchases. Um, so it's it's incredibly useful for them. So can you answer that? Oh, talk to that, Mary. Yeah, Arctic Co-op Development Fund was established um, through a, a federal, um, federal program uh, when it first started. And um, one of the things is that the uh, cooperative system in the Arctic didn't have cash or money back then. Uh, how do we um, obtain funding um, to these assets, to the products and so on? So they established Arctic Co-op Development Fund. Uh, one of the things is that they raise in um, the membership can uh, 
owns that fund. Uh, it's actually by loans to grant, not, it's not a grant, but it's a loan uh, from the various things and they pay into it. They have a loan payback and that's how they, uh, the development uh, it, uh, established itself. Uh, it's a, a multi-million dollar fund now. Um, and, and, and so in, in this sense, it's a payback and uh, they actually return uh, funds back to the members as long as if they use the fund itself. Uh, but it's in, it's celebrated, but it was established uh, years ago through the uh, um, federal uh, program uh, years ago. It came in, back in, itself for many times now. <laughs> it's returned, yeah, mm -hmm. returned back into the, uh, the community many times over now. There's, in, in, to my knowledge, there's no such a fund that exists at, the, at Ilahisak, but um, if, for example, a cooperative, a local cooperative has financial problems or have a hard time uh, financially, the, the, the whole network will pay for whatever the services has to be given, provided to uh, the members and the communities. So uh, until that co-op is able to financially uh, be healthier, let's say. So some cooperatives for years have received the help of other of, of the of the network of all the cooperatives uh, until they were able to uh, to provide everything for uh, for themselves. So that was it is it, it is um, coherent with their uh, slogan that is leaving none behind. So even though there's one co-op struggling, then all the other co-ops will come and help out to make sure that this co-op is able to uh, still provide the the products and services. Great, thank you. Um, so Mary, we had a question, or maybe Faith, you want to um, ask it yourself about about the how the co-op started. And I know Mary, since you grew up in a family that was involved in the co-ops, I think you probably have a personal um, perspective on this idea of the early years of Arctic co-ops too. So Faith, do you want to ask your question? I think I got the, uh, the comment there, so oh, I yeah, can. The comments. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I saw the comment. So. Um, the, uh, uh, for, well, first of all, apologizing to see how uh, if it came from indigenous communities directly from the Inuit, Dene, uh, or Cree, um, and that uh, where did it come from? Actually, um, from years ago, um, there was an individual who recently passed away this year, was very influential in starting up the business in these communities and recommendation and like it's, it didn't happen overnight. We're 60 years ago, uh, that, that was when the community started to establish. Um, and um, the ideas was always looking to best interests of the individual member cooperative in those communities. And um, uh, it's a idea that came uh, from the per perspective is that if it's going to meet the need, that's why the closest model that came into was the cooperative model. The values were there, very similar to the values of, for the things that were uh, being part of the, the federation. Um, when it first started, they first um, met in Church of Manitoba. And that's how the federation started in 1972. And it's um, th th there was a lot of uh, great early leaders that were very strong uh, from that perspective. They were very visionary people. Uh, visionary meaning that this is going to, uh, if it's going to meet the needs of our community and the membership and younger generation, that's how it started in that visionary aspect of the, uh, um, uh, from the indigenous uh, communities and the Inuit perspective and Dene perspective, so. I don't know if that answers to your question, um, Faith, but that's, uh, yeah. Oh, no, thank you. That answers it perfectly. It makes, um, it makes a lot more sense that it's so integrated into the community and so accepted when you have that early support, um, especially in communities, uh, Inuit or Dene or Cree communities. It makes a huge difference. Um, the history there is unsettling. So to have that come um, from the community itself, that's awesome. Okay, we, we have one minute left. So Anne-Marie and Mary, do you have 30 seconds each of, of wisdom to offer everybody? What, what's your, what do you want them to know most about your co-ops? Go ahead, anne -Marie. Oh, <laughs> Mary will have the very last word. That's important. I, well, I maybe one of the things that is very important to me and along the, the research I, I made 
uh, working with the Inuit co-op in Nunavik is that I, it's very important to me not to, um, to folklorize those co-ops. They are modern co-op. We can learn. And as when I say we, I, I mean the, the general uh, co-op movement can learn from the, those cooperatives, even though they are very specific, they have specific identity, specific history, but I think they, they, we can learn a lot from those examples in terms of adapting the co-op model to local specificities with, wherever it is in the world and that we can consider cooperative in a broader, uh, with a broader sense and broader purpose, uh, no matter the type of co-op really. Yeah, uh, one of the things is that um, being in the uh, inclusiveness, I, it's, it's very inclusive in the community. It's ingrained to the people in the community and they're able to do the um, businesses in their language of choice, the culture, the environment. And, and I think this is something that it's not um, a cooperative movement across Canada don't do enough uh, um, good job in promoting themselves. And this is one of the things in the most harsh environment, it's able, we're able to do a basic in, uh, services to, to the members. And I think that's important to be aware of that as well. So thank you very much for the uh, inviting Arctic Cooperative and FC and Q on, the, on behalf of the Indigenous and Inuit um, Cree communities. Mm. Thank, thank you so much for sharing.